exciting than pizza with extra cheese. More interesting than homework. More important than reaching the 12th level of Zing Bozo. Yes, it's time for Professor Helmet on Helmets. Hello, I'm Professor Helmet. Hey, did you ever think about Helmet Science? Well, I do. Helmet Science is my life. Helmets are a big part of everybody's life. You see, over the years, people have developed different kinds of protective headgear. Well, today, people wear helmets for all kinds of reasons. Putting out fires. Inline skating. Skateboarding. Flying in outer space. Playing hockey. He shoots. He scores. Horse riding. And... Whew. Riding a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, well, you get the idea. Why are all kinds of people wearing all kinds of helmets? Well, of course, they look very cool. But helmets aren't just cool. Helmets are a great idea. A helmet helps protect your head. A helmet protects your head. Your head is a very important thing. It weighs 10 to 15 pounds. It's put together from 22 different bones. It's home to your ears, eyes, nose, mouth, teeth, tongue, and of course, your all important, very fragile brain. <laughs> it's pretty fragile too. Your head holds your brain. Your brain. Your brain is fragile. Fragile. Helmets are great. They help protect your brain. Yes, see, that's where helmets come in. Helmets are strong and help protect your head. Here at the Helmet Science Laboratory, we do tests to help ensure that you get a good helmet. Tests like the Impacto Facto Drop. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Okay, let's crack some eggs. Ah, Mondo Perfecto. You see, we check to make sure the helmet is structurally sound so that it can do the job it was designed to do. But it's not just enough to have a helmet. You have to wear it correctly. Here we have a head. And here we have a helmet. Now this helmet is not being worn correctly. It's tilted too far back. The chin strap is loose, and the fit isn't snug. Well, how do you know how to wear your helmet correctly? Well, step one, read the owner's manual. I don't think we can stress the importance of reading the owner's manual. Read the owner's manual. Perhaps we have stressed the importance of reading the owner's manual enough. The owner's manual will explain how to get the most out of your helmet, beginning with proper fit. Now then, your helmet must fit snugly. But you can fine tune the fit with size pads that come with the helmet, like these. You should be able to shake your head without the helmet moving from side to side. The helmet must be worn level on the head. You see, some people wear their helmet on the back of their heads. That's dangerous. The helmet is not worn level on the head, covering the forehead. It offers no protection. Snug, straight, and level. That's how you wear a helmet. Now, why wear a helmet? Well, 85% of all bicycle-related head injuries could be eliminated if everyone wore a properly fitting helmet. But if that's not enough, think about this. 75% of deaths related to bicycles are head injuries. That's why everyone, kids and adults, always need to remember to wear their helmets. Your head is much better protected when you wear a helmet. When you don't, it isn't. Watch this. This is a melon. This melon has about the same consistency as your head. This is a helmet. A good helmet. Still very bumpable. 
Yes. Now, without a helmet. Definitely yucky. So, don't be a melon head. Wear your helmet. Helmets are cool. Hey guys, how's this going? Pretty good, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. What are you guys up to? Just about to ride our bikes out to the movie theater. Oh really? That sounds fun. Yeah, well we had to beg our parents because they thought it was dangerous. Well you know what? They're right if you're not safe. Yeah, but we are safe. Really? Why don't you guys show me how? Well we ride as if we were driving a car. Good. Really? How do you do that? We try to obey all the traffic signs and laws just as normal cars. We also make sure we stop at traffic lights and stay on the right side of the road. This so one time a couple weeks ago, I was about to be late for school, and I thought that if I stopped at the stop sign, it would take too much effort to get going again. But it was a good thing that I did stop because I probably wouldn't have seen the car coming to my right. It probably would have hit me. We try to stay visible by wearing reflective markings, bright colored clothes, and lights at night. We try to be predictable by uh, using things like hand signals, and when we use hand signals, we stick our hands out instead of waving them all around. Uh, we use hand signals so that the car can tell which way we're turning so we can get places safer and faster. Yeah, the other day I came up to this intersection, and this car came around the corner, he wasn't using his blinkers and I wasn't using my hand signals, so we both had to stop, but even though our paths weren't actually going to meet, and we could have prevented that if we both would have been using our turning signals. Yeah, I appreciate when bicyclists use hand signals. Do you guys know the proper ones? Yeah, you stick your hand out which way you're turning because it's required by law and it's courtesy to motorists. That's great that you guys know all that, but there's another rule that you can learn to add to your safety. What's that? Well, if you're coming to an intersection and there's a car ahead, make sure you make eye contact with the driver so that he's aware of your presence and you get an idea of where they're going. But if the car doesn't see you and continues to pull forward, make sure that you stop and allow them to pass so that you don't get hit. Well, this one time, you know, I was riding to the mall. Well, there's lots of routes I could have taken. One, right along a busy street. Two, right on a less busy street, but on the sidewalk. 
but I, I decided to take the less busy street, but ride in the street because I'd be uh, disturbing pedestrians if I rode on the sidewalk. So I always ride on the right side of the street, about a car's door length away from a parked car so that the car door wouldn't open up and smack me. I can't stress the importance of riding on the right side of the road in a straight line. But even then, there's obstacles and hazards that you need to watch out for that could cause an accident, like potholes, ice, and sewer grids. You mentioned riding your bike on the sidewalk, which is totally legal when you're under 15. But when you guys come across pedestrians, you need to get off your bike and pull it off to the side so the pedestrians can safely get around you. You guys seem to know safety rules pretty well. But what kind of safety items do you want to wear when you're riding your bike? I know you need a helmet. A bike bike to ride at night. You need to wear supportive shoes, not flip flops or sandals. You might might be a good idea to bring a water bottle for long trips. You guys sure do know what you're talking about. I feel pretty reassured that you'll be safe on your way to the movies. Yeah, we'll obey all the rules. Alright, well have fun then. In the U.S., it seems like everyone drives. Cars, trucks, everywhere you go. But the fact is, many Americans don't drive. Kids, some working age people, and many older adults never get behind the wheel. Others prefer walking when they can, for exercise or for the simple pleasure of it. Even drivers become walkers when they get out of their cars. These people are America's walkers, pedestrians. If you think about it, we're all pedestrians. Maybe not full time, but at least for part of our day-to-day -day activities. Tragically, pedestrians make up 95,000 of our nation's traffic victims every year. That's the same number killed and injured you'd see if a jet full of people crashed every day. There are a number of reasons for pedestrian auto collisions. Children, our most visible victims, don't understand how traffic works. As we get older, we all, and I mean teens, working age adults, and senior citizens, assume that if we see a car, the driver can see us. But that's not always true, especially at night. Sometimes drivers don't follow the laws that are there to protect the pedestrian. Motorists speed through residential areas and by schools. But it's not kids, or kids and the elderly for that matter, who are the majority of traffic victims. The fact is, working age people make up 58% of our traffic fatalities. No age group is spared because we're all pedestrians. With many traffic casualties, education clearly is an issue. People don't understand the rules of the road. They cross against the light, go jogging late at night wearing dark colors, things like that. And sometimes, there isn't enough enforcement of laws designed to protect pedestrians. Great laws that aren't enforced don't change things at all. But in other cases, it's a design problem that puts the pedestrian at risk or makes it difficult to walk. The problem could be a stretch of road that doesn't have a sidewalk, or maybe a construction obstacle that blocks an existing sidewalk. Sometimes, lights are not timed long enough to give disabled or elderly persons enough time to cross. Curb cuts for wheelchairs and strollers are left out or streets are widened by eliminating sidewalks. These are all problems that wouldn't be tolerated by a driver, but are a routine part of the pedestrian experience. All avoidable problems, and most of them pretty obvious to the untrained eye. But some potentially hazardous situations are the ones that aren't that obvious. Here's a good example. An older existing road that runs smack through the center of a new suburban development. We have nice wide sidewalks here. Wide sidewalks. Cuts for wheelchairs and strollers. Easy on the baby. 
everything you would want in a sidewalk, right? But look, what seems to be a nice entranceway to a new set of homes creates a potentially fatal situation. Here, let me show you what I mean. See, this median blocks pedestrian access to the sidewalk on the other side. Pedestrians are forced to walk out into traffic here just to get across this street. And if the walker doesn't look, or if somebody comes speeding through here, bam, we've got a casualty on our hands. The sad part is, as walkers, we put up with situations like these because that community isn't unique. Problems like these are being imposed on the walking public from coast to coast and in just about every community in between. It's, it, it's not that engineers and designers are out to get the pedestrians or anything. It's, it's because pedestrians don't usually complain. They put up with the inconvenience or they just give up walking altogether. And if they do complain, it's usually an isolated single voice that accomplishes nothing. Makes you wonder, so why should we walk anyway? I mean, if it's so dangerous out there, why bother? What do we get out of it? Well, you can get a lot, actually. Doctors say that walking is about the best exercise there is. It's aerobic and low impact, so it's good for the heart. Exercise reduces cholesterol, which in turn is good for the heart. Helps with weight loss, again, good for the heart. Walking also is a great stress buster, which means it can help lower your blood pressure, which again is good for the heart. It's great for seniors because it helps prevent osteoporosis. It's a good social activity too. Quite frankly, many medical people believe that a healthy exercise like walking is good for just about anything that ails you. I think I need a shower. But as we pointed out, the walker usually isn't taken into account when communities are doing their planning. And that's a shame because walking can be good for a community's health. Walkers give communities a balanced transportation system. This cuts down on the number of cars on the street at any one time. Everyone would like a little less congestion. People walk into stores they don't drive in. More people on foot means more customers for local businesses. Foot traffic makes a neighborhood look safe and inviting. More people walking means fewer cars, which means less air and noise pollution, which makes the community a nicer place to live. Urban sprawl is reduced if a person can complete most of their shopping in one central location, all on foot. It's clear that walking is great for people and their communities. That's why citizens are demanding a more walkable environment. It's time to say no to the status quo. Hey, I kind of like that. <laughs> Yes, thousands of people have decided that walking is too important to give up and have gone to great lengths to protect their right to walk. There are many solutions to the problems we have today. Some involve education, getting our walkers to understand how to coexist with automobiles more safely. Some are enforcement oriented, making those who impede or injure pedestrians pay for their crimes. Others are engineering solutions, finding new ways to alter traffic flow and make neighborhoods more walkable. One engineering idea to help slow traffic in neighborhoods is the introduction of traffic roundabouts. These traffic circles make drivers slow down to navigate around them. Improvements to walking areas, trees, benches, anything to make them more inviting can improve a neighborhood's walkability it might somehow encourage people to walk more instead of always hopping in a car and driving somewhere. Street-level retail that is concentrated in an area helps increase pedestrian flow. Traffic laws that are strictly enforced help to keep casualties down in residential areas. And enforcement of laws that require yielding to pedestrians make a community more walkable. Many communities are changing their laws and redeveloping their business districts to encourage walking. In any community, they should be able to see results if enough people decide to take action that supports pedestrian issues. Now, about your community. Someone has to take responsibility for getting things started, so why not you? 
There's no magic formula for making your community more walkable, but there are a few steps you can take to affect a change. First, you need to organize a group to tackle the problem. It takes an organized chorus of voices to be heard. Next, identify the problems in your community that should be addressed. Organize a town meeting so that the community can tell your group what they want done. You might be surprised. Next, develop a scheme for addressing the problems. Decide how you're going to build support and the steps that you need to take to make things happen. And finally, implement your plan. Take action and stay committed. You won't have to look very far to find a first step. To begin with, you could set a good example. Get out there and walk. You could start a media campaign that encourages people to walk or that tells them how to walk safer. You can help organize downtown activities that will attract pedestrians, like street fairs, art exhibits, festivals, or concerts. You could meet with your traffic engineers to talk about reducing speeds in residential areas. Or you could start a safety campaign that goes into schools and retirement communities. And that's just to start. Now, it may seem overwhelming at first because there's so much that could be and should be done. But like the old saying goes, every long journey begins with a single step, and there are a lot of resources available. The U.S. Department of Transportation is committed to promoting the important role that walking can play in local transportation systems. DOT has developed a wide range of resources to support community pedestrian safety and walkability programs. To begin with, there's the Walk Alert Guide. This guide is the best resource available to present an overview of what you can do in your community and how you can get started. It lays out a proven process for establishing a comprehensive community program and offers lots of examples of what can be done when people like you get involved. The Pedestrian Safety Roadmap is a detailed guide to the numerous other funding, training, research, and program resources that are available to you. The document is organized so you can easily find what you will need now to get organized and start planning, as well as what will be useful later when you're ready to put your strategies into practice. Other resources are available as well. So now it's up to you. You need to get out there and get your community involved because community participation is a key to walkability and safety because it takes active participation to change thinking. And without a basic change in your community's perspective, in citizens, local government, and law enforcement, the rights of pedestrians will continue to be largely ignored. When you're getting started, keep in mind that your plans must take a comprehensive approach, not just calling for a sidewalk or some four-way stop signs. You have to make an overall fundamental change in perspective that puts pedestrians on equal footing with cars for a change. As you and your group move forward, you will have to realize that change doesn't happen overnight. Your group must be committed in order to make things happen. If you stay committed and your leaders energized, you'll see changes over the long haul especially in the way people think about pedestrian issues and their community. So that's the situation. You can't wait for someone else to take action and then complain if something isn't done. You've seen the many ways that your community, your neighbors, can benefit from a more walkable environment. Now it's up to you. Why don't you go for a walk and think about it? Then take action. break from covering politics and politicians, but the truth is my idea of a genuine public servant is that bike mechanic who can replace a spoke or straighten a wheel or make those gears on a 10-speed bike just hum right along. Biking is getting bigger and bigger in this country, as we'll see. A ribbon of riders, 8,000 in all, stretches across the hills of Iowa. Another passes through the canyons of the city of New York. 
Americans have rediscovered the bicycle. Here along the coast of Florida, it's believed that the French invented the bike in 1690, a wooden beam with two wheels. For a time, it was an important mode of transportation. This an organized bike tour in Connecticut. The automobile reduced bikes to the status of toys for a long time. Well, not anymore. Well, well, our general position is that we don't think there ought to be motor vehicles in the city. The police chief of Madison, Wisconsin, a city with more bikes than automobiles. In Madison, they register bikes. They collect money to widen the roads and build special bike paths. This is a city of bike commuting. Town officials estimate there are 100,000 bike trips made each day in Madison that if you eliminated the bike here, they couldn't handle the parking problem. Madison is a university town. So when classes change around here, you know, there'll be this horde of uh, kamikaze bicycles you know, roaring to classes, and really students are very, very busy people, and they don't like to stop for stop signs and think about what side of the street they're driving on. And it's not just the, the college students that drive bicycles to work, and they have to see people in, in suits riding bicycles to work. Madison even has cops on bikes. We've used uh, bicycles for crime-specific problems. Um, residential burglaries, for example, uh, uh, looking at uh, a lot of the street order problems can be handled by police on, on bicycles. Florida is a state that takes bicycling very seriously, a state where, under the law, cyclists are treated exactly the same as motorists. We actively ticket cyclists. The fine for running a uh, traffic light, red light, is 50 bucks, just as if you were um, a motorist. And um, riding at night without a light, $30 fine. Florida is a flat, beautiful state for biking. There are bike tours like this one for people of all ages. Uh, age groups, it's 30s and 40s mostly, but I've had families come with young children. I've had uh, retirees, people anywhere up in their 80s who come on these tours sometimes. One of the most avid bikers in America is Dan Burton. He's ridden from Alaska through Central America, and now he serves as a special advisor on biking to the governor of Florida. 850 people were killed on bikes in this country last year, many of them children. The very youngest children are being hurt coming out of their own driveways, right in front of their home. And that accounts for just about half of all serious injuries to children eight and under. For adults, riding at night is 20 times as dangerous as riding during the day. Night riding is the most lethal bicycling you can get. In Florida, we lose over half of all of our bicycles at night, even though only about 3 to 5 percent of all bike riding is at night. Dan Burden says Florida now has the best bike laws in the country. By the time the baby sleeping serenely in this trailer is old enough to ride herself, the new laws and the new bike trails should bring up the state's safety record. One of the safest places in the country to ride this summer will be Iowa, when the Des Moines Register sponsors its annual Great Bike Ride Across Iowa. Fully supervised, policed by the Highway Patrol, oh. it's a great, rolling, week-long summer camp. Some small towns double, triple, quadruple their size when these bikers arrive and pitch their tents. If you want to ride or learn to ride, there are clinics to tell you how to care for your bike. What we suggest you do instead is to pump your brakes, kind of feather them, apply them, both brakes evenly together, and then let go, and then pump them a little bit more, and just feather your way down the hill. There are tour groups that will teach you about safety first, then take you on one day, weekend, or week-long rides, fully supervised, all hotels attended to, all meals provided. You can bike your way through England or New England, as these folks are doing. Or if the mood strikes and the pocketbook permits, pedal through the wine country of California, France, or yes, the wine country of New Jersey. If I weren't a political reporter for NBC News, this man right here has the job that I'd like to have. He's Chuck McCullough, editor of Biking Magazine, Bicycling Magazine, right? Bicycling, right. And he's here to show us some of the newest things in, in bicycling, newest fads and, and, and equipment in bicycling, which includes, by the way, these two suits that we're wearing. What are these? Uh, these uh, this is my basic after-riding, uh, have, a, have a beer suit uh, made, made of nylon after a, a long 50-mile ride. This is what I relax in. And I this, can ride in it. And this is a commuting suit. This is about two million Americans are now commuting by bicycle. About and this that, yes. is the sort of thing you would wear if you were commuting to keep the rain off. Yes, right? certainly. I'd certainly wear it. And it works. Yes. It's not bad. 
tell us first of all about this little basic setup we have over here. This is a, what is this, a basic Schwinn? This is your very basic household Schwinn. Retails for about uh, $250. A very good uh, beginning bike uh, for beginning cy cyclists. Uh, attached to it is uh, what we call a, a bugger. If you're going to uh, carry your children or anyone's children anywhere, that would be uh, the way to do it. Is that, there, I've seen s seats on the back of bikes. Rode my own children with seats on the back of bikes. Is this a better way to do it? Uh, this is the way I would carry my children. Some seats are very stable and all of that. Uh, this is a little closer to the ground and a little more, more stable and a bit more comfortable for the kids too. It's they also more comfortable in. for the adults, by the way. It's easy to pull right. this trailer. It's not hard to do yes. at all. Let's move over here and take a look at, if you were going to make a recommendation to Americans who are riding bicycles, the, the one safety tip to give them, what would it be? I would say wear a helmet. Absolutely wear a helmet and ride with traffic. Three quarters of all bicycle fatalities every year are caused by head injuries and those things are, are preventable with something like this. Yes. One other thing, we both have on our jackets, I have a little small stripe on the back which isn't enough right. for, for light and what have you. If you're going to ride at night, something like this is an excellent way to do it. At least talk to me a little bit about night riding while I dress this up. Well, uh, don't take night riding. Uh, you should take it seriously. Uh, if you're going to ride at night, I would have a, a light on my bike, on the front of my bike, and I would dress myself up like a candle. There's a group in Florida, in Deerfield Beach, Florida, called Life Signs, which is putting out T-shirts like this, which really light up in the lights, and uh, a good way to, uh, to keep your kids protected, keep yourself protected. You've got shoes on. You've got We've got water bottles here, we've got shirts here. One more question I think a lot of people want to know, why do bicyclers wear these sh tiny, shiny black pants? Well, many uh, use these pants because they look really good in them. The real reason is they're functional. No seams in them, uh, uh, they're very, very co comfortable. You have on, on the inside a chemise lining, a chamois uh, that is absolutely soft uh, in the places you want it to be soft. That's about as thick as a catcher's mitt down there, isn't it? And it yes, gives it you is. a little bit of protection against that sore rear end when it's all over with. That's what you need. Well, Jane, a quick look at all these biking materials and back to you. Tonight, the Road Warrior is checking out a new fashion that is road-related. It's not just for fun. Patrick Frazier reports this new shiny symbol could be a lifesaver. Take a close look at your TV. What do you see? What appears to be one person riding a bike, right? Actually, there are three cyclists. You only spotted one because only one was wearing the new Life Sign t-shirt. It will identify them quick, clearly and quickly um, to the motorist. Then I think we can avoid a lot of these uh, 10,000 uh, fatalities a year. Moran hopes the t-shirt will prevent some of those deaths. The symbolic V, which comes from the Latin word Veda, means life, and will alert drivers the glow up ahead is a person. We're using fluorescent inks uh, that are easily identifiable in daytime, and we're also using reflective inks that are easily identifiable at night. As Moran demonstrated, the inks are 70 to 100 times as powerful as a white t-shirt. And tests by 3M showed the shirts will be 75% reflective when they're worn out. Now, besides being good looking and safe, if the unfortunate does happen, the t-shirts have one other attraction. Down here at the bottom is a label. With this indelible ink marker, you can put your child's name, his address, and who to contact in case of an emergency. They are also being targeted for bikers and joggers. Moran figures his patented idea can't miss. We know kids are going to wear a t-shirt. Uh, so it's to make it easy, yes. If they stand the potential of being hit in the highways, absolutely. Of course, if they're playing basketball at the gym, they don't need it. So far, you can only buy the t-shirts through Moran's 800 number. But he's negotiating with a large retail chain. And soon the life signs, he hopes, will be as common as road signs. Patrick Frazier, New Center 7, Deerfield Beach. We lead active lives here in Florida. The sun and the great weather, along with the physical fitness craze, have children and adults heading outdoors to bicycle, walk, jog, and just have fun the year round. There are dangers associated with outdoor activities, however, and the statistics are sobering. In 1986, 111 Florida people were killed on bicycles. In 1985, 649 pedestrians were killed. Bicycle and pedestrian fatalities are the greatest threat to a person from the time they're born to the time they're 65. Over a half million bicycle accidents each year require hospital treatment. Statistically, um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission and National Safety Council's figures indicate that 
approximately 10,000 Americans uh, lose their lives on our streets and highways outside the vehicle. In other words, those are pedestrians and cyclists. Kevin Moran, president of Life Safety International, has designed a product he hopes will save some lives. A t-shirt with a V safety symbol. And he'd like to see it receive international attention and acceptance. During the daylight hours, the fluorescent colors in the shirt stand out and are highly visible to motorists. At night, a reflective paint takes over. There's a blend of two things. Uh, for daytime, you need fluorescence or fluorescent inks. And for nighttime, you need retroreflective uh, materials. And those are simply materials that return the light back to its source. And if you're driving a car, it returns the light back to your car. Um, but additionally, uh, we've identified detection, and those things both help in detection. But the recognition, or in other words, actually understanding what one is seeing is very, very important. And that's why I've taken fluorescent inks, retroreflective inks, and then the symbol of the V to uh, give a message and a clear signature to motorists so that they aren't guessing uh, what they actually see out there. Mm -hmm. And that uh, millisecond of lapse time can be a determining factor of accident avoidance or not. Riding a bicycle at night is considered 20 times more dangerous than riding in daylight hours. And visibility was an important consideration in the development of the shirts. Visibility statistics um, of the shirt and test indications that I've received both from the Florida Department of Transportation pedestrian coordinator and uh, Dr. Moore at the U.S. Navy indicate that the shirt has act is actually visible at up to and greater than a thousand feet at night. In contrast, a white t-shirt is only visible to about 125 feet and a black t-shirt or a gray t-shirt is only visible to about 60 feet. Durability was also a consideration. Moms would be looking for something that could be washed. That's a major concern with any safety garment, of course, is that it, is, it works for its intended purpose. Um, 3M, in its seven years of research on this product, has devised uh, some pretty revolutionary uh, concepts. I call it space-age technology. And in doing so, they've actually embedded millions of tiny spheres in this ink that are mirror coated on one half of their surface. And when they are in the curing process, those mirror coated spheres actually turn and focus out because of their polarity. And in doing so, it creates a mirror image. So the shirt is washable and durable, but unless the wearer finds it fashionable, they probably won't wear it. So far, the attempt at making a fashion statement seems to be working. The response from adults and kids has been excellent. The children have been most responsive to the product, uh, and I'm told by many people whose children have been guinea pigs for the development of the product. They actually love the product, they wear it to bed as pajamas, and they feel very safe and secure in this uh, shirt. You are trying to cover all the bases with the shirt, and you've included a label that you feel strongly about. What is contained on the label? I found that there's much more information that's required when somebody actually does require help. And hopefully, if uh, the shirt uh, can help avoid accidents. Uh, we want to prevent those, certainly. But um, if there is a requirement for hospital treatment, there is a label supplied that addresses those things that physicians and hospitals need, and that is emergency phone numbers, physician, their phone number, uh, insurance company, and policy number, very important, uh, blood type, uh, medical history, allergies, and etc. They even include an indelible ink marker to complete the package. My greatest goal, of course, is to educate uh, uh, people as to the fact that there are things that they can do for their own personal safety. And in doing so, I hope to uh, begin with uh, very small school-age children and develop additional products to help educate uh, children as to what they might do to uh, protect themselves against traffic. And in doing so, I'd like to attack the bottom line of the fatals in this country, which is uh, the largest single killer of people in this country from the time they're born to the time they're 65. So when you're out biking, jogging, or exercising, day or night, some simple precautions are in order. Know the rules of the road. Obey the laws. Let yourself be seen and wear protection when it's appropriate. Welcome to Between the Lines, a 39 WTZL public affairs program. 
Here's your host, Jeanette Jordan. Hello and welcome to Between the Lines. Did you know that Broward County has the nation's highest rate of bicycle fatalities? Or that pedestrian fatalities increased from 18 in the first four months of 1986 to 27 during the same period this year? Or that motorcycle fatalities have increased over 50% this year? It should come as no surprise that our streets and highways are not user-friendly for pedestrians or cyclists. My guests today are experts on the subject and will tell us how we can maximize our safety and keep from becoming grim highway statistics. Please welcome Kevin Moran president of Life Safety International, and Dan Burden, the Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator for the Florida Department of Transportation and Project Director of Bike Ed America. Welcome, Kevin and Dan. Okay, um, how does Florida rank, the, the whole state of Florida rank nationally in terms of pedestrian and cyclist accidents and fatalities? In, in both cases, we're number one. In raw numbers, we've led all other states now for over five years. Why is this? We don't know all of the answers. We do know that motorists are attuned to looking for big objects. They simply aren't giving bicyclists or pedestrians the recognition that they need. We don't have the best environment. We don't have a good system of sidewalks. We don't have a good system of true. shared roads. Mm -hmm. All those combined with the unique population that Florida has presents a very serious problem. Well, you said we've been leading the nation for the past five years. Does this mean that our accidents, our fatalities involving pedestrians and cyclists is increasing? It is increasing. In fact, with uh, anyone outside of an automobile, you have a greater chance of losing your life in Florida than any other state. In just a five-year period, we doubled the number of bicyclists that were killed when nationwide the count actually went down. But why is this? I mean, is there a... a are motorists particularly interested in, in committing vehicular homicide, or do we just have more people out there on the streets riding bicycles and walking and are changing lifestyles? It's well, more than any other state, we have people that are more tightly packed together in a space where you must depend on the car. You get your very dense urban spaces, and things actually improve for both the pedestrian and the bicyclist. Mm -hmm. But we're kind of in between. We're the fastest growing state in the nation. We've inherited a roadway system that was rural in origin, and it doesn't have the right provisions for people who want to walk, who want I've to noticed. ride bikes. Yes, I've noticed that. We also are the bellwether state for uh, older adults. We have more of them. Uh, if they get hurt, they don't recover when a younger person might. Okay. What ed, uh, Dan, what is Bike Ed America? That's my greatest hope for all of us, that if we start with children, and we give them both the skills, the attitude, and the habits that they need to form early in life about how they're going to deal with traffic. They can become self-reliant. They can not only look out for their own well-being, but as they mature and become, in time, motorists, mm -hmm. they'll start to look out for people. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have lost some of our generations in the kind of caring we need, but if we can start with children, we can do it. It's a school-based program mm -hmm. that includes a minimum of 10 hours of instruction that includes in class, on bike, and on road instruction. We have driver's ed in our high schools. Do we not uh, reach the kids earlier than that when they're becoming mobile on bicycles and they're out in traffic? Mm -hmm. Do we, 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 are we failing that in our education system? We, we may have a more difficult time reaching children when they're in their mid-teens. That's a tough time to reach anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, we all remember that that was the time when we were daredevils, that we thought we were invincible. Immortal. And we didn't really like listening to adults. Mm -hmm. If we can reach people when they're younger, like in uh, 8, 9, 10 years old, mm -hmm. they're like sponges. They're eager to learn how they fit into life. And uh, so that's the philosophy, that if we can ingrain the right attitudes and approaches earlier in life, those habits are going to serve us well throughout okay. life. Okay. Kevin, what is Life Safety International? Life Safety International is a newly formed company uh, that's dedicated to safety and bringing about safety products into the marketplace. And uh, with the support of people out on the street actually wearing the product, we'll continue to bring about new products. And we're going to show one of those products in a little yes. while. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about it. Uh, why did you get involved in this? What, what caused this uh, idea? There were several things that happened during my lifetime that punctuated my life, uh, like many events that punctuate other people's lives. Uh, my brother was seriously injured in a traffic accident uh, while a student at 
Florida State University. Mm -hmm. And more recently, one of my dear friends lost a son on Christmas Eve uh, who died in front of his house, uh, mistaken as a garbage can. An automobile. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. fatality. Uh, uh, Kevin, you had, had mentioned reaching young children early. Are they <clears throat> particularly at risk? And, and Kevin had mentioned a young child. Are, are children particularly at risk, as, at risk as, as pedestrians or cyclists? Children are especially uh, at risk. They, first of all, don't have the skills they need. Children don't have quite the peripheral vision as an adult. They have, in fact, one-third less. They can't locate sound. They cannot judge closure speed. Motors need to be looking out for children more than they are. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of motors aren't aware of these factors. And yes, children simply lack life experience, survival skills. What's the earliest age that you would recommend that we turn a child loose, unsupervised, on a bike, in the street? National research points that nine years old is a good average. Nine years old? Nine years old, fourth grade essentially. And that, of course, is where we're aiming our education. Do you think that uh, realistically, say, in real life, that, that I see five- and six-year-olds on little teensy-wincy two-wheelers riding up and down the street all the time? Well, no, in fact, not only are children starting too early, they're starting unsupervised. A lot of parents, both members of the family, work, and they assume that uh, with a little bit of instruction from school or the police, their kids are going to manage. Mm -hmm. And it just isn't true. Mm -hmm. As a society, we've failed to understand the limitations of our children at an early age. Okay. Uh, Kevin, the, uh, what is the most important factor in becoming a fatality or an accident victim if you're on a bike or if you're a pedestrian? Well, I would I have to say unequivocally that it would be the fact that somebody is not seen in, in, uh, as a potential victim by the motorist. But aren't motorists alert enough? I mean, we, we are looking where we're going most of the time, I would hope. Surely we are. Um, however, there's a lot of other things that enter into the actually seeing a person on the street. We're, we're dealing with some very complex uh, events that are occurring. We're moving a vehicle down the road. We have our hands and our feet moving, we may have a distraction, um, there may be oncoming traffic, there may be glare. There's a lot of multiple uh, variables in here mm -hmm. that are in, enter into actually seeing a pedestrian or bicyclist that may be secondary. So you would, you would say, bottom line then, that being seen is the most important factor? Uh, I mean, other than using due caution uh, being, yourself, uh, let being me seen quickly and, and easily and far enough away so that a motorist can react to you? Right. Being seen, I think, is, is a broad-based word that we're using that incorporates two major uh, words. One is the actual detection and the second is recognition. Okay. Now you have come up with this product. Mm -hmm. It's a t-shirt. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, as a result of some new developments by 3M Corporation, I have uh, introduced, or I am introducing, a, a new product that was uh, aired on the Today Show a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that product uh, incorporates retroreflective or reflective inks, as you were, mm -hmm. uh, as well as fluorescent inks. Mm -hmm. And those in tandem, mixed with a symbol, uh, what I call my life sign, will give motors the uh, important information that they need. Okay. We have some of these t-shirts right here. Maybe we could just... Uh show them right now mm -hmm. and it says life signs right now i i would assume that on camera with our lights and everything this is just going to look like a pretty ordinary t-shirt with a v symbol in it it's very bright but there's something special about this reflective ink it's it doesn't need much light to bounce off is is, is this the uh that's correct. The, the light, any light source that actually hits this garment or mm -hmm. these inks will return back to the, its source, mm -hmm. equal intensity light or even greater. Okay. We are going to stop right about now and mm -hmm. take a break. Okay. But when we come back, we're going to have an extraordinary demonstration of the reflective capabilities that you just won't believe. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome back to Between the Lines. My guests today are 
experts on the uh, subject of pedestrian and cyclist safety. And to tell you the truth, before we started to talk about doing this show, I didn't realize quite how at risk we all are when we're not inside our homes or inside our cars. And we do have the American love affair with the automobile. It's scary out there. You have come up with this wonderful product, this Life Signs t-shirt, and it does some, something very extraordinary when vision might be impaired by lack of light. And we have a clip of this t-shirt in action. And Dan, I'm, we're going to go to that clip right now. And Dan, I'm going to ask you to, to tell us what we're seeing. Okay. Okay. We're not seeing we're, what looks like okay, very much the, here. The viewers here should see right well, we now uh, a first uh, product. The bicyclist on the right was wearing the high conspicuity uh, V. Mm -hmm. It's much later that you see the person wearing the white shirt, and it isn't actually until you can actually see the bike that you see there's a third person there wearing dark clothing. And that's where most people are today. They're wearing dark clothing, mm -hmm. or at best, they're wearing white. Uh huh. The, the V, when it lights up at night, gives you at least 900 or 1,000 feet uh -huh. of recognition. Where a white shirt, it's down as low as 150 to 250 feet. And that's just not enough time for the motorist to recognize what it is and take action. And of course, wearing dark clothes is practically it's suicidal. Yeah. It, 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 it totally literally is suicidal. suicidal. It literally is. Incredible. Incredible. Now, the, the, um, the ink that's used that, that reflects from so little light, is, is that similar to day glow or fluorescent paints? And I mean, haven't they been around for years, uh, Kevin? No. As a matter of fact, this is a revolutionary new ink, uh, thanks to 3M Corporation that's been developing this ink for many years. It's a, I consider it a major breakthrough in safety. Uh, just a bit about the ink is they use millions of tiny spheres and those spheres are mixed into a paste, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a three, it's actually a three-part catalyst. And then when those spheres are embedded into the actual ink material, they're polarized and those, those spheres, which are mirror coated on one half side, mm -hmm. actually turn and focus out. Oh my goodness, it almost seems like a living thing. Uh, it, it almost <laughs> is. Yeah. That's incredible. Does it have other applications other than, say, we've primarily been talking about pedestrians and focusing in on cyclists, but does it have other applications? What about runners and... Uh... Sure. Um, you, you might imagine uh, if a hunter had this thing on, he would be easily recognized. Uh, if somebody were in a boat in South Florida, certainly that uh, could take place. Or you can actually, if uh, research, uh, I'm sorry, rescue people are actually looking for someone, that can give them the first clue that somebody is actually out there and they're and looking for What them. about this, you, you had, had said, I'm going to hold the shirt up again so we can get a, a look at it mm -hmm. there. What about this V-shaped design? It's on the front and it's, it's also on the back. Right. What does that mean? Is there a particular uh, meaning to that? Absolutely. Uh, that's probably the most significant uh, factor of the shirt, in my opinion. Uh, the V is a symbol that I have identified or I am using or have selected as a symbol for life. And that was derived from the Latin word vita, which, which ma means actually means life, life, or vital, which uh, is an American word, which is derivative of vital, mm -hmm. vita. Or you might want to use it as, uh, as visible. But the important thing is that we are introducing a symbol. And in this country, there is no readily recognizable symbol for life. And I think it's time we well, have Well, I, I would assume that if enough people were to be wearing these, that mm -hmm. that V would become a very recognized symbol. Sure, that would become a public mandate. Now, there's, there's one other aspect of this shirt. There's inside the shirt, at the bottom, there's this label. Mm -hmm. What's the label for? And it even comes with a pen to, right. to fill it out. Uh, the, the label is certainly very important. It's uh, one of the uh, benefits of the garment is that a person wearing the shirt, it would not become necessary to carry a wallet. That gives critical information to emergency people. Such name, as address. We're looking at it right now. We have name, address, uh, phone number, emergency contact number, medical information, which includes uh, uh, insurance blood policy, type. blood type, Insurance history. policy? Why? Why would you put your insurance policy number there? Well, I'm doing my research. That's a very good question. I'm doing my research, I interviewed several physicians and EMTs, and one of the prime questions for rendering health care is who the policy, uh, who is protected, and what the policy number. And if anybody who's been into an emergency room will certainly uh, 
concur with that. Uh, that's one of the first questions that they're asked. Hmm. Interesting. I would also assume that uh, for children who, you know, might be scared and forget their vital statistics and also with parents working and children being alone so much mm -hmm. uh, in case of an emergency to have that information re readily available might sure. be a real safety factor how do you think kids are going to accept the the design you know kids are so conscious of how they look and what they're wearing and their clothes they want to look different but they want to fit in with everybody else do you think that that kids will accept this uh, early preliminary testing uh, with the garment uh, and my so-called guinea pigs, <laughs> God bless them all, uh -huh. uh, have fallen in love with the product and they feel very safe and secure with uh, by wearing it. And I'm told that uh, many parents are relating to me that their children are wearing them to bed at night. So uh -huh. that's reassuring. Uh -huh. oh, that's <laughs> in case they sleepwalk. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> my daughter has been using them and I can't get it away from her. Uh, day or night. She's well, using them as pajamas. <laughs> She's well, a product that's pieces. getting this much wear and tear, though, this mm -hmm. reflective ink, won't it uh, crumble off after a few washings? Is it washable? Is it? Can you stick it in the, the clothes dryer? Sure. This How's is, it going to hold th up? This product is designed for ordinary washing in home washing machines. Um, the, the product and the inks are designed to maintain the reflectivity when the garment is worn out, 75% of the re reflectivity is maintained. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what about cold weather, though, when it, when it, and, and kids are going to school, even here in South Florida, when it gets chilly out, they're going to tend to want to put a sweater over it or a jacket over it. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? It's a good question. Uh, what, what I said earlier, what is Life Safety International? Life Safety is dedicated to bringing out safety products, and certainly I am addressing that. Cold weather gear, absolutely. We're working on our winter wardrobe already, mm -hmm. as well as uh, backpacks and things like that. The, the message of the V is, is critical, that we give motorists something to identify a pedestrian with. You know, it, it occurs to me, though, that, um, say, for kids, you could get one in a very large size, and if you're wearing a sweater, say, well, just look, from the time you leave the door on your bicycle till the time you get to school, just keep it on over your jacket or over your clothes, and then when, once you get to school, you can take it off and put it in your book bag and, and carry it around, that that might be a solution to that until you come out with these other mm -hmm. uh, products. Sure. Um, we are going to stop and take a break right now, but when we come back, I have a lot more questions about uh, things like uh, selective perception and all kinds of good things. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome back to Between the Lines. My guest today, Kevin Moran, President of Life, Life Safety International, right. and uh, uh, Dan Burden. Burden <laughs> of Bike at America are talking about how we can protect ourselves on the, the roads and the highways when we're not in a car. Um, I had mentioned something called uh, selective perception that I'd like Dan to speak to, and I also want to mention that we're going to tell you how you can get one of these wonderful T-shirts later in the program. What is selective perception? Why should we be concerned about it? Yeah. In our urban space, we've gotten a very complex visual soup out there. We have the advertising, the buildings, the, everything that's in the urban presence. And all of us, at any given instant, when we're driving, walking, whatever, are filled with this stimuli. And we need to select out things that are critical to us, things that are vital and important. We've learned to do that. For motorists, it's turned out to be things that are big, they go fast and they hurt us. Mm -hmm. We've overlooked things with a low profile, like a pedestrian or a bicyclist. And we've learned it just out of survival. We've got to change our concept and begin to select out life forms, people. Mm -hmm. uh, now that Florida has over 30% of its fatals, people outside of the car, we need to start thinking about people. Would you repeat that statistic once sure. more? That's incredible. Over 30% of all people killed in traffic in Florida are outside of the car. You know, with all the publicity about wearing seat belts, which we have to agree is a terrific it's thing fine. to do, I wear mine even if I'm just sitting in the car with the motor off. But I, I think that we always think of a fatality as being the motorist or the passenger inside the car. I'm uh, amazed at that. Yeah. Even school buses. We think of last year, we lost 131 people in a school bus accident. 
Only one was a passenger on a school bus. All the rest were outside of the school bus. Oh. And That's so startling. what we do is we train ourselves. We need to select out people as being important in that complex visual soup. Kevin's product, the V shape, the unique signature that people need to begin to recognize that pattern, a unique pattern mm -hmm. in that space do, is what will Does help. your research tell you that people do respond more quickly to a symbol? Sure, uh, without a doubt. I think uh, there isn't a child that's, uh, that's raised uh, from, the, from the time he's uh, an infant where he doesn't have tools that are basic, uh, the building blocks, for example, the pegs, the holes, the squares, the triangles. Mm -hmm. We're all taught symbol recognition uh, at, at a very young age, and that's one of the reasons why I uh, chose a symbol for life, uh, simply because uh, our, our traffic signs already use symbols. So we're used to, to seeing and registering a symbol. Right, symbol recognition. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, you describe Florida's children as auto-dependent. They are. We are becoming, as a culture, auto-dependent, which might be all right for adults. We certainly can make those choices. But our children no longer can make the trips they need in their neighborhoods. We've taken the commerce out. We, we in fact, have a lot of schools that are on main roads. My own daughter, who is 10 years old, can't get to school. I'm her taxi driver, mm -hmm. or my wife is her taxi driver all the time. So from the time my child is born until she's 16 years of age, I'm serving as her transportation. She doesn't have the skills. She doesn't have the places she can go with her own two legs. And it's robbing her of learning early self-reliance, independence, the kind of thing that I grew up with mm -hmm. that made me unique. We all did. We all did. A lot of us did. And we've got to think about it. We've got to return to our children that gift of being able to use their own mobility. Mm -hmm. And likewise... And thinking the, of their feet as a mode of transportation. <laughs> exactly. At the other end of the spectrum, we're doing the same thing. Uh, people who are getting older are perhaps realizing they don't want to drive everywhere, or they don't want to drive at night, or they don't want to drive at all, mm -hmm. and they now become auto-dependent on the younger generation to take care of them anytime they and want to And that can go. cause a lot of inconvenience and resentment, I And it's a loss of dignity. Oh, yes. Our people need dignity in transportation. In Florida, we have a frightening statistic that 3.8 million of our 12 million are uh, what we call transportation disadvantaged. They cannot drive. They're too young, they're too old, they've lost their license, they're handicapped, any of a number of reasons. 3.8 million, over 30% of our people, are transportation disadvantaged. The well, only I, state in the nation. I can, I can, what, what do you mean the only state in the nation? No other state has that high of a percentage of people who cannot get places they'd like to go. Well, I can tell you it's a severe disadvantage being, because I, I know when I first moved down here, I did not drive. I didn't know how to drive. I came from an urban area up north where uh, public transportation was easy, cheap, and uh, we walked a lot. We were within walking distance right. of, of most places. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, T-shirt the again. Um, I have it here in a, a beautiful bright yellow. Does it come in this color? Does it come in various colors? Uh, currently we're offering it in the uh, white with the day glow colors or day glow fluorescent colors. Uh, we certainly have planned uh, shortly to come out with some additional colors as well. Okay, we have an 800 number that we're going to put up on the screen right now for any of our viewers who are interested in purchasing these for themselves, and I would recommend it for anyone who jogs, runs, walks a dog, bicycles. Also, if they have a loved one, particularly children, does it come in children's sizes? Absolutely. We have children so small to adult uh, extra large. Okay, we have that mm -hmm. number up there right now. Um, is it going to be available in retail stores anytime soon? Uh, well, we hope to. Uh, we're still looking for distribution. Everything is happening so quickly. Uh, the Today Show only happened about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it, everything is moving along very rapidly. However, we, I have a discussion with some of the people from Birdines tomorrow. Birdines. Yes, ma'am. Well, let's I'm hope they'll... Looking forward to that meeting. Yeah, let's mm -hmm. hope they'll wanna, want to do this. Um, Dan, can you give us, I mean, other than making oneself as visible as possible, and this product certainly enhances your, your visibility, very briefly, are there some other quick things that you could tell us that people are commonly doing wrong that they should 
Sure. First and foremost... We have about 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> they're assuming they're being seen when they're not. They need to recognize, they need to be defensive, whether they're on a bike or as a pedestrian. And they need to be aware of traveling places where people are going to see them quicker. Okay. And okay. obey all the rules. Okay. All right. <laughs> all Listen, rules. thank you both for being with us, and good luck thank with this, this product. Um, the more people who wear it, the safer we'll all be. Thank you. This is Jeanette Jordan for Between the Lines. Thank you.